We will begin shortly, everyone. We will begin very shortly, everyone. Hang tight. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Monday night lecture series. I'm absolutely ecstatic about what we're going to discuss and the 
um, the conversation with that we're going to engage in on today. There's been so much that has taken place on the campus of Clark Atlanta University, particular attention around student organizing. And really, if you think about it, within the last five years from 2020 on, there's been a lot of protests, participation, and activism. As we know, Atlanta is a rich repository okay. of history. It's a rich place where much of what has taken place in the civil rights movement is literally rooted here. And so we thought that it would uh, be only appropriate in this given period of time to take a look during Social Work Month, during Women's Month, but during this historic occasion, that we take a moment to really reflect on student movement and activism. We are going to draw your attention to a huge monument for those of you on the campus of Clark Atlanta University. It is a celebration of the Atlanta student movement. And so we're excited about the history making uh, event which made it possible for that street to be called the Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard. So we have an exciting special guest here on today, and we are going to certainly enjoy ourselves. I'm going to allow the Dean to introduce our special guest. My name is Dr. Gary O. White. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work, and the Monday Night Lecture Team Series also involves my colleague, Dr. William Thomas. And so much of the work we've been doing around voting and activism in the School of Social Work now finds its way to taking a closer look at it. So before we begin, I wanna take the opportunity right now to introduce our Dean, to bring you greetings from our Dean, Jenny Jones. Dean Jones. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. White, for setting the stage for what I think is going to be an invigorating, exciting um, evening. As you stated, uh, our purpose with the Monday Night Lecture is to provide you with information and up to, and um, um, current and old information around what is so important to this profession. And tonight, I think uh, our discussion around uh, the Atlanta student movement, uh, the impetus of that and how that movement has led us to the naming of, uh, renaming of Fair Street to Atlanta Student Movement uh, Boulevard. And I guess before we go any further, I want to ask, I want to poll, our speaker is coming on, who is uh, City Councilman Julian, Michael Julian Bond. He's on it as well, dude. Oh, he's on He's yeah. on, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Councilman Bond, I just want to pose the question to these young people to find out how many of them knew, uh, yeah, turn your cameras on. How many of you guys uh, know the significance of Fair Street, that um, uh, Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard that runs through the heart of this uh, AUC uh, used to be named Fair Street. And do you know how, why the name was changed? Or did you know it used to be anything other than Atlanta Student Movement? I mean, other than Fair Street. Anybody? Anybody? Well, sit tight. You're about yes. to. Yes. Who, who is Jess? Oscar. Oscar Copeland. Well, yes, Oscar. Tell us Tell us who you are. Well, I mean, you know about it. Well, I mean, my name is Oscar Copeland. And so when I attended Atlanta University, uh, Michael, your father was the mayor of the city of Atlanta. And um, and so that particular time, yes, I do remember just just bringing history back. I used to, I attended Mount Moriah Baptist Church, it was on the corner of Fair Street. So just coming to Atlanta, I was introduced to the, you know, to that particular location. And so with, um, as you're talking about the movement or the change, when it was the street name, name was changed to, uh, to the current name, I do remember that, um, I do remember that occurring. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be quiet because my mind is just going really quick because there was a lot happening at the time uh, the, with the uh, killing of a lot of young black men and different things of that nature. And um, and then that doesn't seem to totally been resolved here in Atlanta, but that's a whole nother story. But 
that's kind of what I'm thinking about the history then and today, but I do remember the change of the name of the street. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Copeland. At least you you have some uh, re uh, reference point for, for this change. But now let me introduce you all to Councilman Michael Julian Bond. As Mr. Copeland said, uh, Councilman Bond is the son of Julian Bond. Uh, he currently serves with Post One at large and uh, has been in this role for many years. Now you have to understand that Councilman Bond comes from a family of um, a long line of, of folks who are committed to social justice, committed to civil rights and, and committed to seeing this city of Atlanta be the best that it can be to serve our people. I'm not going to say any more about him because I do want him to spend this time talking with you about uh, how the Fair Street, uh, how Atlanta City Movement Boulevard uh, came about when it had been Fair Street for so many years and what his role was involved in that and and really kind of talk about how this came to be. So Councilman Bond, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Dean. And thank you, Dr. White. And it's really, I want to thank you for the invitation uh, to, to speak to your group. And just want to say good evening to everyone. It's really an honor uh, for me to be here with you. And I'll just get right to the point. You know, I grew up in Atlanta in the Atlanta University Center area. I was born on Beckless Street. I lived there until I was about one years old. My brother set our house on fire in the backyard. And then we moved over on Yearly Street. And if you go to the back of the Morehouse Purdue dorm, uh, the, the, very, the house that exists there at the back of their parking lot was next door to ours. Our house is no longer there. It was consumed uh, by Morehouse, but then we moved from Yearly over to Sunset Avenue over by Morris Brown, where my mother uh, continues to live. And so, you know, growing up in that particular area, we were uh, there in the orbit of the original Pascal's restaurant and hotel. And of course, Pascal's was not just the center of the universe for the Black community in Atlanta, it really was the crossroads for business, traveling business people and politicals and artists, musicians, athletes in the Black community across the country. And so my parents were very much involved in initiating uh, and forming the Atlanta student movement. Lonnie King who was a student at Morehouse who had come out of the Navy and went, was going to Morehouse, approached my dad and, his, and another uh, friend of his, James Freed, at what was then Yates and Milton, was a black pharmacy uh, started by an executive from the Citizens Trust Bank and uh, from the Atlanta Life Insurance Company, a business person and a pharmacist. It was there where the Clark AU Student Center now exists. Uh, they, they met, they had a lunch counter, they met in there and they talked about the students uh, from North Carolina a and who had been involved in sit-ins, had initiated the sit-ins and got a lot of the national attention. They had a discussion that it should happen in Atlanta. From that discussion, they got with students from all around the, the various AU center schools. There were six institutions and they decided to begin a movement and they formed a coalition called the Committee on Human Rights. Uh, the presidents of the institutions resisted at first because uh, they felt that uh, there would be some reprisals against the institutions, if not the students uh, themselves and their families. And so uh, Dr. Brawley, who James Brawley uh, Avenue is named after, spoke up in that meeting and said that the president should get behind the students. Then Dr. Clement, who was president of Atlanta University, said you should, if you're going to do this, because prior to this time, most of the civil rights activist uh, advancements had, had either been negotiated through politics or had been litigated by the NAACP. So there were no real direct uh, movements in Atlanta until this time. Dr. Clinton said that you should put your 
uh, grievances in writing and present them to the broader community so people understand why you're doing that. And so out of that came the Appeal for Human Rights, which was uh, principally written by Dr. Rosalind Pope, who just passed away you know, a few, a uh, couple, a month or so ago. And my dad and Ben Brown, who's a graduate of Clark Atlanta University and some others. And they presented that document and they began their movement. That resulted in the deseg not only the desegregation of Atlanta, but also affected the 1960 presidential election uh, because when Dr. King, he had been asked by the black leadership in Atlanta not to do a movement in Atlanta, but he got involved with the students in October of 1960. He got arrested and uh, blacks at that time were Lincoln Republicans. Uh, Daddy King asked uh, the Nixon campaign to get involved, they declined. The Kennedy campaign got involved, got Dr. King out of jail. From that, uh, black Republicans switched to Democrats and they elected John Kennedy. And they put out a flyer which was called the Blue Bomb, which was a, a blue sheet, a blue colored sheet that, in, that black ministers from across the Southeast endorsed uh, Kennedy. Having said all that, growing up, I was born in 66, first generation of African Americans born constitutionally free after the Public Accommodations Act and the Voting Rights Act, uh, we spent, we lived in the vicinity of Pasco, as I mentioned, on, um, on Yearly Street. We were always, you know, we would go to Pasco's, of course, quite often. And growing up there from 1966 until really well until adulthood, I heard a lot of stories about people who had been involved in the student movement, had been involved generally in the civil rights movement, that the stories weren't told or reflected. And it, in hearing how, uh, how all these others, you know, it seemed like every time I would go to Pascal's or be somewhere over along MLK, you know, whether it was at Busy Bee or Miss Frazier's cafeteria up the street, you know, somewhere up there or Alex Barbecue, you always run into people who had been involved, who uh, had suffered greatly, you know, had, had sacrificed a lot of, there were a lot of people who were in school at the time at the various institutions who didn't finish because they got involved in the civil rights movement. And that was a badge of honor to go to jail, to be jailed, to give up your education for something greater for the broader community. And now at this time in the future where I was meeting and talking to them, you know, you were, it's almost like post-traumatic stress that mm -hmm. you heard from those people who had been involved. You know, there was a bitterness. You know, they, they were uh, grateful uh, for having made the sacrifice, but there was still some bitterness there. And so I had served on this. This is my second iteration on the city council. When I was first elected in the 90s, I served in the district seat. And we did the historic uh, Olympic markers around uh, the AU Center uh, because at that time, you know, there was a lot of pushback from Olympic organizers and sponsors not to go into the, the black community. It was a fear that, you know, these international visitors would come to the black community and be set upon uh, by negative elements. And so that was an insult to many of us as we said, you know what, that this area of town is some of the most historic, not just for Atlanta, but nationally for the country. And so we wanted to make sure we put up historical markers so people knew where they were going. And, you know, of course, the real experience of the Olympics that was belied by the fact that, you know, it's a proven fact that when Europeans come to America, they don't want to see more Europeans. They want to see the indigenous people. And, uh, you know, places like Alex Barbecue ran out of meat. Pascals ran out of food because there were so many <laughs> wow. people there. Wow. But uh, what, what happened over those years, though, is that people hadn't had their story told. So I left the city council in 2001. I returned. I was asked to run for this seat in, uh, 2000, in 2009. And when I came back, I said, you know, it was coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And so there on what used to be Raymond Street uh, that runs behind the, the AU Center Library from MLK all the way over to Old Fair Street, which is now Student Movement Boulevard, mm. the, the second SNCC office in Atlanta uh, existed 
at 6 Raymond Street. So we said, you know, we're gonna do something to commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they were having their anniversary that February uh, back up in North Carolina. And so we got together, We I put in a ordinance to rename that section of Raymond Street after SNCC, which even 50 years later was tremendously uh, controversial in some people's eyes uh, because of the work that SNCC had done in the 1960s, not just here in Atlanta, uh, but of course around the country. And out of that conversation, we, we, did the, we didn't get to dedicate the street until that April, but we took one of the street signs uh, to their reunion and presented it and has, uh, well, you know, maybe I can show it to you. I've got a copy here in my office. I don't know if you can, can you see that? You see it perfect. Okay, yeah. that has all yeah. the signatures of most of the original members of SNCC. And of course I've got a copy of the Student Movement Boulevard, Boulevard sign here in my office as well. And, one of the street toppers, one of the ones who crossed the street in here. But said all that to say that there were many people here in Atlanta that had been involved in SNCC, and there were many that had not been involved in SNCC that were involved in the Atlanta student movement. And they were saying that, well, you know, without the Atlanta student movement happening, you know, SNCC probably would have formed because it was forming out of the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the NAACP, they were looking to start a youth arm, but there were those who felt like the Atlanta student movement had not been talked about, had not been hailed. And, you know, for the most part, that was accurate. That was true. I mean, growing up here in Atlanta, even though, you know, my parents were very active, my father obviously was very active. Um, and, but there was a feeling, a resent, kind of an undercurrent of resentment against civil rights uh, leaders as I was growing up here in Atlanta. You know, it's like the, success, the successful desegregation of Atlanta as, as it is written in Mayor Ivan Island's memoirs. He said there were two things principally that changed Atlanta's destiny and made it, quote, the city too busy to hate. That was the advent of air conditioning, which allowed Atlanta to recruit businesses from the North and be able to hospitably, you know, situate them here because of the heat. It's cheaper to do business. They got air conditioning. They, they relocate a lot of businesses and the Atlanta student movement. And so with that, the success of that desegregation Atlanta versus Atlanta versus Montgomery, Atlanta versus Mobile, Atlanta versus versus Jackson and these other places brought a lot of business to, to the city and it, and it prospered. But yet at the same time, that commercial interest, that the uh, Chamber of Commerce interest, didn't want to honor the civil rights legacy that made that happen. And so we wanted to bring that to the fore. So we set up a city commission to look at an appropriate way to honor the Atlanta student movement. You know, now with the SNCC legislation, we just introduced that because we had, there was a national kind of uh, vibe going on to recognize SNCC. So we didn't take the time to set up a, a commit commission, but given the, the subtle resentment that we face in renaming a tiny little street, <laughs> you know, it's not even a main uh, thoroughfare. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had full community buy-in. So we set up a commission representative, representative of all the AUC schools at the time, because at that time, for the students who don't know, CAU was Atlanta University and Clark College. So we had six representatives who were veterans of the Atlanta student movement that were appointed. And then we had the additional uh, member, uh, uh, Miss uh, Althea Boone, who was the widow of Joseph E. Boone. Many of you may be familiar with the street. He was the pastor of Rush Congregational Church that exists there counter corner from the AU library who provided uh, space for the students to organize for almost five years for free in his church. And they, they didn't just, allow, they allowed them to organize, they fed the students, they accommodated them, they let them use their, what was it called? A lithiograph machine, you know, no Xerox machine, a lithiograph machine that you used to crank out copies on. 
and allow them to use the phones, et cetera. She, she represented him and we had one, one or two others. And so we set up a series of meetings uh, with the community and, and amongst the committee to try to find an appropriate way to honor uh, the student movement and, bring, and to highlight them. And during the course of that, uh, we decided that we would do something broader than simply rename uh, a portion of Fair Street. Now, they rec we recommended Fair Street because it ran through the entire AU Center. It touches the majority of the schools in the area, either physically or, uh, or um, kind of spiritually, because uh, Cleophas J J uh, Johnson Park, who used to be University Park, he was the band director at Marsh Brown for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, CAU, Morehouse, and it almost touches Spelman. You have to cross it to go to the library. So all students who are in that area, you know, of course, would be touched by that street. And so we we picked we picked a portion. We didn't go across uh, Joseph Lowry, Old Ashby Street, because we didn't want to get into the controversy of having homeowners probably, you know, uh, feeling one way or the other about having their street name changed. Because historically, depending on who you're naming it for, what you're naming it for, and where you're doing it, you could either be embraced or it could be highly controversial. And so in this instance, we were very fortunate that the only resident who resided on the street was the president of Morehouse at the time, at the Davis house that was um, oh, man, Dr. Franklin. And so he gave, as the only resident, he gave us a letter of support and we were able to go to the city council and ultimately get a unanimous vote. Now, it was really strange when we had, if, if, if you could ever pull up that particular meeting to let the students review it, you know, it'd be interesting because we had to lay it on pretty thick for some members of the council. And I don't mean that those of European descent, there were one or two African-Americans who are just squeamish about street renamings, period. And one of whom, whose uh, father was very much involved in the civil rights movement, that was giving us some pushback. But we eventually, after the members of the student movement that were there, and present uh, spoke before the council, uh, we were able to win, to win them over. And so as a build out of that renaming, uh, we have also designated a linear park tour. So, and the erection of some mar historical markers. There are two at the corner there, of uh, Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard and uh, James P. Brawley, uh, where the movement initiated there, you can, read you know the the account of what i've partially related here today and see a copy of the appeal for human rights that's enshrined there now forever and so we've erected about 13 markers in and around the au center and on mlk and in and around downtown where the students uh you know held their um demonstrations we had dr uh Brown Nagin from Harvard University, the author of Courage to the Set. Uh, she wrote the, the, what is now the, the seminal book on the history of the Atlanta movement and the Atlanta student movement to do the research for us. And also Belma Fan, who is a, a historian with Osla. And so we're actually planning to erect two more markers on the campus of CAU about the quadrangle. We have another marker we will erect for Pascal's. Uh, restaurant and for Sale Hall, which held a lot of the mass meetings uh, for the students to continue it. Now, one of the things that uh, we wanted to, to do, and this is my fault that we haven't gotten this off the ground, those markers have the capacity to be di digitally interactive. So we've conducted about 130 interviews with people who were actually there, you know, as it relates to the subject matter of each marker that can relate to you to tell your story. And we also had former Senator Vincent Ford uh, for his graduate work at CAU did, uh, a, did a thesis on the Atlanta Student Movement. And we have access to the uh, audio interviews that he did that also are, I think number over a hundred. And so we're trying to get them into a space now where the QR codes and those things are working. 
you know, it's easy to put the markers up, but it's very difficult to find somebody to uh, make the back house operation uh, come through. But when that's up and running, you'll be able to take a virtual tour with, uh, you know, from marker to marker to basically relive uh, the Atlanta student movement uh, deal. I have a link that I'm trying to, to find of uh, some of those videos that I want to send to you that you could share with uh, your students. And once I do, I will send it on. Mm -hmm. And we presented that at the AU Center Library back in 2018. It, 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 it runs like a documentary, but it's not really an official documentary, but it's about an hour, 10 minutes sample of some of the interviews that we've done. And I'm glad we did them because many of the folks, of course, they have kind of gone to passed on, including my father, Alana King. So um, it is really, a, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just talking. No, no, I just wanted to say, I, first of all, this is such rich history. I, I'm just uh, feeling with joy that as you talk about how this came about but I wanted you to go back to something you said that, that it's really was really kind of the impetus for my thinking about uh, bringing this this um, Monday night lecture to be you talked about how you guys got community buy-in for the name renaming of the street and can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Because we're trying to help. The purpose of these Monday night lectures are, uh, for this year have the theme has been focused on voting, voting and get voter engagement, voter rights. And we're trying to help our students understand that voting is not just at the the presidential level or voting at the uh, you know at the, at that federal level, but the importance of city council, city government. And you're talking about the involvement of community. You're talking about city government. And, and so I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you all got that, that buy-in and your involvement, involvement in the community in this process. Well, of course, yes. I mean, getting the community buy-in, whatever you're doing in government is, is necessary. Uh, even on things where you believe that you've got broad spread support, you want to be able to document that you have that support, just don't want to be able to say that you have it. And so when we formed the commission, we had many public meetings. We solicited the public in many ways. We said, at that time, it was just pretty much email or posted on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And, but of course the dreaded robo calls that people say that they don't like, but when they don't, when people don't get the robo call, they're mad, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. so they don't want to be harassed, but you know they want to know what's going on, and it's their choice whether they come or not. But I believe we had about five or six uh, public meetings, and uh -huh. for this, because this people were warm to the idea, uh, they were very supportive. When we went down that final day to have the final vote with the Atlanta City Council, we had a broad number of, of supporters. We had uh, letters of documentation of support from the various institutions and the churches in the community and mm -hmm. the uh, neighborhood associations and mm -hmm. the NPUs, the neighborhood planning units. So mm -hmm. we went to everyone who was a part of the community and say, hey, this is what we're doing and we'd like to have your documented support. And of course, we, we, we made presentations to those individuals. And this is much the same way that SNCC and, and the Atlanta Student Movement got support when they were trying to desegregate uh, the city and engage in their civil rights activities. They went mm -hmm. directly to the citizens that they were advocating for and got their buy-in. And they basically repeated those steps, you know, trying to get the, the street renamed and the funding for the uh, marker program that we're still, that is still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. So again, the takeaway here is, is understanding the importance of your city government and the role that communities play in making those things come to come to be. Absolutely. I mean, even the, like I said, the, the, there were two council members who were of African descent that, you know, weren't as, as warm and supportive as we thought, but we didn't ignore them. You know, we did and we didn't let them off the hook. We continue mm -hmm. to communicate with those who appear to be opposite our position to try to win them over up until mm -hmm. the very last minute of the vote. 
You mm -hmm. never want to give up on talking to your elected officials or those who are responsible for making the decision that affects you, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, then that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I think has been missing in a lot of recent movements, you know, generally around the country, is that you do get a lot of dialogue, you get a lot of messaging, but you don't get a lot of communication between the activists and the people who are responsible for making the decision. One of the markers that we have slated to go up around the quadrangle uh, at CAU is about that very thing. Uh, there was a march on downtown by the students, about 4,000 students. They were going to first encircle the Georgia State Capitol. And they were warned not to do that by an informant from the police who had an African-American girlfriend in the Black community. Mm -hmm. And so, what, but what happened that all the students got the message. Now, when the students uh, publicized the uh, appeal for human rights, Governor Vanderveer at the time said that students didn't write it. It must have been written in Russia, you know, that you know, th this is a communist document, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, which, you know, which is unfathomable because it was published all over the world, literally. New York Times, the Harvard Crimson, it was published in, uh, by the Guardian in England, you know, it was published all over the world. You know, people uh, so, so were impressed and supported the document. But this branch of students ended up going around the Capitol anyway, and they demanded to meet with the governor. And guess what? Lonnie King, Herschel, uh, Shalinor, and some other students, of, and a few dozen students actually got to go in and meet with Governor Vanderbilt. And even though they didn't win him over, they didn't let him off the hook of his public obligation as an elected official that he need to sit and meet with, at least hear them out about what they said. And you know that that's something that students need to always remember is that you need to be engaged in your, with your elected official and holding them accountable for what their elected obligation is to you as a voter. And, you know, of course, people need to also remember that if you, and this is a good study for students, is to take any political jurisdiction, whether it be a city, a county, or a state, or even the United States, and overlay that with where they spend their money, and, mm -hmm. and overlay that with the voter turnout maps, and where people vote the most, that's where the resources for government are often spent. You know, the, the two highest voting precincts in Georgia are located right in the heart of the black community here in Atlanta. I think it's 10A and 10L, right there off of Lynnhurst Drive, mm -hmm. right off of uh, between Cascade and, and MLK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other two highest are over in Buckhead in District 7 and 8, you know, for all of the state of Georgia. And so if you look at where the city spends its money, it's in the, you know, primarily it's in those areas. And, you know, because politicians, I hate to say, are like John Dillinger. They asked Dillinger, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is, right? <laughs> and politicians go, they turn their attention to where the votes are. And so if, if, if you mobilize your community to vote, you should and will get a response out of your an increased response out of your elected official. Councilman Bond, this is Dr. White. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm sitting up here, you know, I've, um, I've looked at the timeline created by Lonnie King. I uh, had the opportunity to uh, watch the PBS special, um, um, Foot Soldiers, which picks up a little bit later, 1964, uh, Georgiana Thomas' work. But something you said that stood out, um, and um, and that is related to that appeal for human rights. That uh, two things: number one, the appeal for human rights, uh, when Rosalind Pope and and your dad got together to write that. And it's interesting because Lonnie King referred to uh, he referred to your father as you know, among the intellectual leaders as well. Um, and so when that work came in terms of crafting that, to listen to that governor and to watch the video of him claiming that it was impossible that some college right. students could have written this to go as far as to talk about uh, the communists. Now that communist piece, um, which is definitely, um, if you have a chance to put this in context, 
because President Clement, well, all six of the uh, president, uh, the Council of Presidents were really, really nervous mm. about that label of, of a communist um, 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 act. But that document was so incredibly well written. Did your dad ever talk to you about that experience? Yes, he, he did. And, you know, he had uh, a tremendous amount of respect for, for, for Roz and Pope. They were in Howard Zinn's house, the Spelman, mm -hmm. famous Spelman uh, mm -hmm. professor, uh, mm -hmm. when, when, they, when they typed it up. And one of the things he related to me from, he said, from his personal perspective as a student, he said what, what really bothered him, you know, one of the things that bothered him about segregation is that if he was an African-American going to an African-American institution, earning a college degree that is supposed to be recognized in the public and private se sector, uh, you know, for just having completed it, you know, th th this is something he's achieved, and yet still it's going to be devalued only because of the color of his skin, where he knows he's working harder at Morehouse, right, than, he's, than some of these other folks might be working at some of these other uh, majority institutions, he says, why am I investing? He says, so how can I invest in this knowing that I'm only going to get a second class result? And so he said that we have to have uh, a, a level of equality. We have to have a, a level of human recognition uh, mm -hmm. between peoples so that we can be equal, so that we can be free. Because as long as there is a perception that people of color are less than then you know if if you know you're not a, you're not a full human being, you you don't have a full recognition of of human rights, and so you know he said at first they were kind of bummed about having to write it because they felt like it was obvious what they were facing, you know, uh, it was it should be obvious to everybody, but you know he said it, it, he said as time has gone on, so he appreciated it uh, that they actually had had taken the time and and set that out. And also want to point out, particularly for students, is that, you know, they had allies who were older in the business community and the, in the religious community that helped to pay for that ad uh, to, to go into the uh, journal uh, constitution at the time because they had to pay for it, you know. And so, you know, you, you, you're not you have to have good allies to go into your fight with you to to, to help you make it, you know, down down your road. I was particularly surprised um, when we look back on that, the way they engaged the, the faculty um, in, in this regard, but also recognizing that the, the, the leaders of the, the university were very nervous. I mean, and in, in really incredibly nervous, but something these students did, um, and you touched on organizing before, or the Dillinger, let's call it the Dillinger approach, uh, something you said um, struck me in terms of what they what these students did during this movement. They decided to protest, according to Lonnie King, they decided to protest public tax based institutions. Mm -hmm. So going after the Greyhound bus station, Trailways, Atlanta City Hall, Fulton County, and the state capitol. Um, why was that so important to to you think? And as, as in terms of what you've learned or you've heard, what, what was so important about that? Well, that, that was important because it is where someone who has a private inst institution could, probably could argue that their institution is private, that they have certain rights to either give access or restrict access to their private institution. Uh, when you're talking about taxpayer funded public institution, is you know just undisputed. Everybody pays taxes, and so if you're going to accept my taxes but not accept me, that is a, a you know a, a, that that is fundamentally wrong. And so going after these public institutions where you know it's just undisputed that hey I've paid to support this institution, you should not be able to keep me out. Uh, you know is is a brilliant philosophy uh, to to go after, and you know. Charles, we just honored Charles Black down here a week ago at City Hall. He led almost uh, a couple of hundred students on that same day. It was March the 9th. Yep. It was the anniversary. And, uh, you know, they, they got arrested and went to the city farm. You know, 76 students, you know, they were arrested. 
you know, my my dad and I think about 12 others were arrested at Atlanta City Hall, where I am right now, uh, down in the cafeteria. Uh, you know, they went uh, down to uh, several of the, uh, I think, the state cafeteria, and they got they got locked up down there at several other places. But these are all places that are taxpayer funded, that, you know, that everybody has made a contribution to. And if you're going to accept my money, you should be able to accept me. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's so important um, um, when we talk to students and just the study, uh, you know, we have the term Sankofa means go back and get. And often we're trying to tell students who, um, you know, when they want to be activists or engaged, we say you have to go back and study the organizers of old. In doing so, you'll see that everything that they did was part of a plan. Mm-hmm. It was so impressive. Um, to me, as you you studied it, that they were very strategic in terms of uh, certainly um, what they do. What type of advice you give students now around community engagement and and being involved, and why is it so critical to organize today? Well, what I try to advise people to do is the very same advice that you would give: is to go back and study what has worked. You know, when you look at a lot of the documentaries like Eyes on the Prize and others, one of the great things is they show all these great movement marches and all these great demonstrations. The bad thing about what they don't have time to do is to show all of the work in organizing that went on prior to any one of those demonstrations or marches. There is a tremendous amount of work that goes on away from the cameras, you know, away from the social media posts, away from Facebook and Instagram that you need to be engaged in in preparing for your demonstration. You know, if you're if you're going to demonstrate and people are likely to get arrested, you need to have people lined up to get them out of jail. If you're going to have a demonstration, you need signs, you need people to make the signs. You need people to transport the the people. You need to have observers who are not in the demonstration that can report back to your headquarters and you need to have a headquarters so that, you know, say, hey, X amount of people got locked up. We need to go get them. Or, you know, th- this is happening. We need to change our, our strategy. You know, it, it's really a broader field operation. It's like building an orchestra. You know, it sounds good when it's playing together, but there are many, everybody's playing a different part and they're also playing a different instrument. And so it needs to be an overriding strategy on whatever that you're doing. And then again, you need to be able to communicate you know, with people who don't agree with you that have sway over the decision making uh, of the decision you're trying to affect. You need to make sure that you're in constant communication. And for those who are publicly elected, you need to be holding them accountable and, you know, reaching out and trying to build as many coalitions around your issue as possible. You can't communicate or, or reach out enough. And, you know, in, in, you need to also decide from the beginning, are you just going to do a demonstration or are you trying to build a movement? Mm. Because movement has to be sustained. You know, a movement just isn't an Instagram post or a Facebook video, right? Where you get a thousand likes and everybody's slapping their hands and then wonder why things didn't change. You know, movement has to be sustained, has to be thought out, has to be planned. And, you know, you, you do that best when you lay down and, and, and set out your strategy ahead of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Councilman, man, I am. I'm, I told you, you got me over here twisted in my seat. This is so exciting and so good to hear you break it down in the way that you have. I mean, you just it's it's I, that's this is exactly what I was hoping for. But what I'd like to do is turn to um, our uh, colleague, Dr. Thomas, who has his class in there with him tonight to see if there's just any questions or comments that you all would like to make. And and, and Councilman Bond, uh, let me just say, William Thomas has led the initiative here in our school around voter engagement. Uh, And he, yes, he has done a fabulous job. And we teamed up with uh, the honors program at Clark Atlanta. And so between our school and the honors program, we had over 2000 touch points around voter engagement. Mm, That's excellent. Yes, yes. Dr. Thomas? I think he's talking with one of the students now. 
while Dr. Thomas is, is coming on. Dr. Thomas? You're on uh, mute, Doc. You're muted. He's holding a class as we speak, uh, Councilman. He's holding his class. Do you, you have any comments to make? <laughs> They're very thankful. But I would just like, I would just like to say, Dean, that we are living here at this school and existing in hollowed ground. We are, yes, yes, we are in hollowed ground. There are a lot of okay. things. The very first time I'm hearing some things, and I'm very, I'm getting very emotional about it because these are some of the things I've been I've been telling students all the time that we need to resist when we can, and I'd hope to get this 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 Zoom so that, so that I can I, I can share it with my students. Okay. Okay. Because I'm, I've been saying the same things that happened before, the same things that the speaker do, did, the same thing I'm saying that we can do now if we bind together. Yes. yes. Sorry to be so emotional about it because we do not do enough. We elect those people to go to serve on our behalf and we have a right to tell them what we want them to do. And students, some of them here, <laughs> <laughs> don't seem to understand that. Yeah. yeah and they yeah. do not do it. Yeah. Yeah. The councilman said, and I wrote it down, they have a public obligation to you as a voter. Exactly. Exactly. To vote them in, they obligated to, to, to speak with you. Yes. Yeah, and absolutely. To work on your behalf. I'm sorry, Councilman, go ahead. No, I was just agreeing with you. And, you know, people need to know that your vote is the only power guaranteed you by the constitution here in the United States. You don't let anybody diminish your power. You know, I've got a Superman here behind my desk. You never see Superman saying, hey, guess what? I'm not gonna be bulletproof today. I'm not <laughs> gonna fly today, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, don't see Wonder Woman giving up her, you know, magic lasso, right? So why would you give up your power? Don't ever, ever do that. And so people are, they're always, if you won't tell your elected official what's on your mind, please know that there is a line down the block of other people who will. You need to make sure that you're petitioning your government at every level, whether it is the municipal, county, state, federal, and that all of these people work for you. And there's nothing wrong with telling them so. You're not going to lose anything by calling people on the carpet because that's exactly what being an elected official is all about. Well, I want to take this opportunity uh, of Councilman Bond to once again, thank you. Um, we know you have a very busy schedule and we have a great deal of appreciation for you coming in on, on today. For those of you who've watched this, um, um, you'll see that he walked us through really a historic uh, movement in terms of talking about Lonnie King, his father, as well as the student movement and what they have done to accomplish um, the efforts around desegregation. Um, this was all connected as well to why he, along with others, took the bold step to rename Fair Street the Atlanta student movement. And anyone watching this video, he logs on, he sits down, and there it is, boldly above his head with signatures on them. And so we can't thank you enough for uh, coming in. We're going to pay attention to the effort around the additional markers. We are going to do the work uh, to really organize around it. And students, there's a historic piece I want to bring to your attention. He talked about Sales Hall on the campus of Morehouse College. I need you all to pay attention to it because that's also where the first class of the school, Atlanta School of Social Work in 1920 was formed, right there in Sales Hall. So there's a spiritual connection that's critical to what he is sharing. Um, there's some next steps that we want to encourage you all to do. We want you to uh, get to know your representatives. We need, to, we need you to know how they vote. 
We need you to be familiar with the issues that are impacting our community. So when you get a chance to speak with the Honorable Bond, we know that you've got to have the elevator speech. The D John Dillinger piece, I'm going to go to that. But in this regard, I'm going to say you need to also identify whether or not you're a, constitu a direct constituent of his because it's such a critical priority of who he serves. In fact, you need to know who your representatives are at every level. So we can't thank you enough uh, for coming to us. We'd love to get some closing comments for you before our dean closes the session out. Um, uh, Councilman Bond. Oh, well, thank you again very much for, for having me. It's always a pleasure to be in, whether it's virtually or actually on the grounds of uh, Clark Atlanta University. My, my grandfather, my father's father finished his academic career there as academic dean under Dr. Clement uh, before he passed away. And so, and having grown up it, right there at, on the edge of the campus, you know, I always love an opportunity to, to, to come and, and, and participate uh, with the students. But I just want to also just an extend an invitation to the staff and the students. If you need me for anything, I want to provide my, my numbers for you. Uh, my office number is 404-330-6770. Uh, my email address is mbond, M-B-O-N-D, at atlantaga.gov, and my cell phone is 404-274-8111. My bat phone is 678-886-2286, and I'm accessible to you as your citywide uh, representative. And just want to encourage the students. I was a student in Atlanta University uh, Center, participated in many uh, voter registration drives, got involved with the NAACP, uh, you know, youth in college uh, division. Want to encourage you to do the same. But if not there, please get involved somewhere to make an impact. And if we can be of any help or give you any advice that we can, we'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you very much, Dean. Councilman Bond, I was just going to say there's nothing left for me to say. Thank you so much for meeting with us this afternoon, this evening, and sharing with us uh, uh, this whole movement piece. And, and just, just really, you, you made this more of a, it's a lecture, but it's also a uh, a sharing of information and encouragement to say to us and to our students the, the number of ways that we can get involved and also reminding us what those elected officials obligation is to us. And I thank you for that. Uh, I know this was short notice, but I really, really, really do appreciate you spending this hour with us this evening. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. And everyone else, thank you for, uh, for participating tonight. And uh, we'll, we'll be ready uh, for the next one. Good, day. Good night, Dr. Um,